All right, our next presenter is going to be Chavdar Lavlov, Lalov, sorry, um, who's going to tell us about cyclic um, causal algebras and oriented graphs. It's a wild ride, get ready. Um, and his mentor <laughs> was um, Ms. Guanji Yu. So thank you, Chavdar. Honorable jury, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. So little children are afraid of ghosts. Undergraduate students are afraid of tensors and tensor product. However, in practice, these notions are not that difficult to understand. If we can say that complex numbers were the generalization of real numbers, we can say that tensors were the generalization of vectors. For example, vectors are tensors of rank one, matrices are tensors of rank two, three-dimensional arrays are tensors of rank three, and so on. We will introduce tensor product just by an example. If we have one four-dimensional space, R4, and we multiply it with another one, then we just get a 16-dimensional space, R16. We can demonstrate this with this example. We have two two by two matrices, and what happens after the tensor product is just a four by four matrix, which is uh, obtained in a specific way. One of the reasons tensor product is so important is because with it, we can define one of the most fundamental objects in mathematics, the so-called tensor algebra. And the way I like to think about it is like a language. If we have an alphabet, a, B, C, and so on of any size. We can introduce words by gluing the letters through the use of tensor product. And we can make sentences by adding these words through adding tensors. Now, what is this in more mathematical terms? If we take a vector space V with a basis B, then we can say that roughly this vector space V is all sentences made of one letter words. V tensor V is just all sentences made of two letter words, and so on. And now the tensor algebra is just combining all these different types of sentences in the creation of a language. And something which is interesting for this language is because since adding is commutative, we can interchange things. This means that the sentence one plus two is three is the same as one plus three is two, and so on. So in order to define the object we study in our project, we're gonna start destroying our language. And what we'll do is that we're gonna forbid certain two-letter subwords. And what I mean by that is that, for example, if we forbid the word no, since it is contained in not, this is, it will go to zero. And not a recoit will become a recoit. <laughs> now in more mathematical terms, if we take the tensor algebra of V and we take the quotient by an ideal generated by a subspace I in V tensor V, then we get the destroyed language. What mathematicians are interested in is controlling this destruction with respect to Hilbert series. And whenever this destruction is nice, it's controllable, we may say that the algebraic equivalent is a Kazul quadratic algebra. Now what makes I, does this subspace a nice destructor? We can visualize this to an oriented graph. We will place a vector space at each edge and each edge then will represent a special subspace. For example, E1 will be I tensor V tensor V, E2 will be V tensor I tensor V, and so on. If E1, E2, E3 form a distributive lattice, I will explain this in a moment, then we say that TVI is for Kazoo. We can make bigger 
or smaller such, such graphs. And this will respectively imply three, four, five, six, and so on kazumis. If this distributive lattice al always comes into play, then we say that TVI is kazoo. Now a, a lattice is an interesting structure, algebraic structure. It can be represented well with two operations, union intersection for sets. And these two laws called the absorption laws always hold. It can be verified easily through the use of these diagrams. If we interchange the sets with vector spaces created from the edges, and we interchange the vector sum, we interchange the union with vector sum, one can prove that this is also true. Now distributivity can be represented again by sets pretty nicely. This relation holds. But if we change the union in vector sum, then the same relation is not always true. So vector spaces are not generally a distributive lattice. And so this identity is actually the key to casualness. What we do in this project is to generalize this notion. We consider cycles. For example, here we have this edge E3, which connects the third vertex with the first. And what E3 will represent is this vector space where I, which was the subspace in V tensor V, will be splitted in the first and third position of the tensor product. And we can again ask the same question whether E1, E2, and E3 form distributive lattice. If they do, then we say that TVI is cyclic true kazoo. We, uh, we can consider smaller or bigger cycles, and this will respectively imply two, three, four, five, and so on cyclic kazoonis. If it's true for every single value, then we say that TVI is cyclic kazoo. Um, in our project, we wanted to compare these two structures. And what we started it with it was to prove standard fundamental properties. Firstly, we proved that if A and B are cyclic and kazoo algebras, then by combining them through the use of tensor product and making one bigger algebra, it is also cyclic and kazoo. This is something which is also common for kazoo algebras. And the next thing we did was to prove that if we have an algebra and we take it, its dual, so we take the dual space here and the orthogonal complement of i, then TV star i orthogonal is also cyclic and kazoo. But on a deeper level, kazoo algebras and cyclic kazoo algebras are quite different. There's this theorem that the symmetric algebra this is just taking the quotient of y tensor x, x tensor y for all x and y. This implies actually commutativity in the algebra. Then the symmetric algebra is kazoo. What we did in our project was to prove that if the dimension of v is 2, then sv is not cyclic and kazoo for any n bigger or equal to 3. And then something interesting happened. If we quantize the symmetric algebra, I square the commutativity property, then it turned out we conjectured that this algebra is cyclic and kazoo if and only if A is not an nth root of unity. We also checked uh, the first cases, which were verified. And in the moment, we're working on an induction. So in the future, we plan to study more fundamental properties about kazoo and cyclic kazoo algebras to see which properties are common for both of them and where they differ. And we want to prove a con the conjecture. Um, actually, we think that it is implied by two theorems in non-commutative geometry. Although our observations are not rigorous, and we will probably need several months to verify it. I would like to acknowledge all these people 
uh, my amazing mentor, Wang Ye Yu, for all her, for all her constant support, and Professor Buzrukavnikov for suggesting this topic, as well as to Dr. Rickert for helping me with my paper and presentation, and to many other people, the math department at MIT, and maybe many other alumni from RSI or just Bulgarians, which, <laughs> <laughs> which helped me publish my paper, as well as to RSI, C, and MIT, all my sponsors for making this opportunity possible. Thank you. Okay, so now that everybody in this room understands tensor algebras, does anybody have questions? Yes. This is the universal pop-up question. No. <laughs> Are there any like real world applications? <laughs> 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 yeah. The question was whether there are real world applications. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the importance of kazoo and cyclic kazoo algebras are in other fields of mathematics. For cyclic kazoo algebras, we haven't found anything uh, apart from those connections in non-commutative geometry. The applications of kazoo algebras are connected to other fields in mathematics, even more advanced. I do not have enough knowledge. But for ex one of them, for example, is connected to category theory and states that certain subcategories of the category of so, um, the semi-simple Lie algebras are like governed by these kazoo algebras. And in many other structures, we, for example, we know that if an algebra A is kazoo, then its dual is o also kazoo. And this duality, this connection, are naturally arises in other fields of mathematics. Okay, are there other questions? Okay. Um, you look like you maybe have a question. I'm going to put you on the spot. So, could you give us a highlights overview of maybe the proof of your three case? Yeah. Uh, so, the question is whether I can provide an example. Uh, Chagar, I can think... you go back to the slide where you state the theorem? Sorry? Oh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, I maybe think. Yeah, it's a conjecture. Oh, so. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so maybe n equals 4 is maybe more interesting, but doesn't. So we know that the algebra, it's a theorem, firstly, that oops, this is kazoo. This follows from one thesis of a PhD. So um, now what we'll do is to try to use these results with induction to prove cyclic kazoons. So roughly, for kazoo is represented by this graph. We have four points. Here we have Vs. And like the equivalent of this for cyclic kazoon is, is this. And now there's this theorem. I should state it um, maybe in the following way. If we have that x1, xn are subspaces in Vintezer n, then this can be connected to exactness in chain complexes of vector spaces. So what I mean here, here, we have intersection. And actually, the exactness, we can continue this. Where here, here we have two intersections with connected with direct product. Here we have direct product with two intersections. And the exactness of this complex is actually connected to this distributivity. 
but it is connected if and only if every proper subset of x1 to xn makes a distributive lattice. And now, what is interesting is that if we erase one of these, we get the usual Kazumis. So we can use this theorem that every proper subset is a distributive lattice to connect it with Kazumis. And the problem translates to these complexes of vector spaces. And through standard linear algebra, one can like prove this for n4. For example, here you'll have 1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4 v tensor 4. And here you'll have all pairs x1, 2. But this will be 0. Uh, one can prove that. So we'll have like, they need like to have, the indices need to have distance 2. So the only possible things will be x1, 3, which is the intersection of x1, x3. And with standard linear algebra methods, one can prove the exactness, which, is, which means image equals kernel at each of the linear transformations. Good yeah. work. Are there other questions? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I have a question. Haha, yeah. -ha, you thought you were done. Okay, can you go back a couple slides? I'll yeah. tell you when to stop. Um, right, so um, you proved this, that the algebra, when um, you look at the the product of the two groups is going to be um, cyclic, right? Yeah. You have a conjecture about um, more generalized products. So when you have not just two spaces, but you're going to have um, n spaces or even infinite spaces. It can just uh, add Right, you can one. induct for the finite case, but what about for the infinite case? Yeah, we work only with finite dimensional vector spaces. Okay. What do, can oh. you specify your? Uh, um, I mean, if you had like an infinite um, tensor product of spaces instead of, instead of um, like, an infinite, like, v times w times x yeah. times y times, and so on and so forth forever yeah, and ever and ever. Yes. It's okay if you don't have an answer that's tricky. I haven't considered multiplying infinitely maybe, but I think it will be preserved uh, just, the, just because all such fundamental properties such t seem to transfer, and the intuition should be correct in this case. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Shabdar. Yeah, Wait. Thank you. Last thing, everybody, look under your seats. No, not under your seats, on the backs of your seats. There's tensor products and direct sums there. Look at the print. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, Chabdar. <laughs>